This morning, we are going to look at Acts chapter 9 for a moment or two. Acts chapter 9. This is uh, right after the conversion of Paul, uh, these verses. And I want to take some time to just read um, some of these verses to kind of set things in motion. uh, And then we'll see what they have to say. So we see in in verses uh, uh, 1 that Paul was breathing threats against um, the Christians. And then he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then on verse, in verse 17, Jesus sends Ananias uh, to Saul, who's in Damascus now, who's blind. And then in verse 18, the um, scales fell from his eyes. He regained his sight. He was baptized and he took food. So now we're um, at really uh, halfway through verse 19. It says, now for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, he is the Son of God. All those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a large basket. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. Uh, The last time I was able to preach when Pastor Doug went away, uh, I'm sure all of you remember that message. It must be ingrained in your hearts and minds. So anybody want to tell me what I preached on the last time I was here? That's right. Buddy, you're right. The cost of discipleship. (laughs) But... um, Today, I want to kind of just go along that same concept about discipleship. And I am wondering, how long does it, make, does it take to make a disciple? What do you think? A lifetime. Someone else. Seconds. Someone else. And everything in between. You know, I am... I struggle with this whole concept of making disciples and stuff because I look at my life and I see that it has taken years and years and years. But when I look back at those first weeks, months, and years, it seems like, you know, those were the glory years, the love and the passion and the desire for Christ. They were there. And as I read this uh, passage of Scripture, it struck me that if we believe uh, in verse 19, it said, for several days the Apostle Paul, right after he was saved, was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And then he began to proclaim Jesus. It seems like he became a disciple instantaneously or within a few days right? How can this hater of Jesus, all of a sudden, after just a little incident of, you know, meeting Christ on the road, becoming blind, and then Ananias talking to him, and all of a sudden he's baptized, and he's proclaiming Christ. He has become a disciple of Jesus in a very, very short period of time. And he committed his life, the rest of his life, to making disciples for Jesus. In fact, I found this even more astonishing, that in verse 25, 
the Jews were after Paul. They didn't like what he was doing. And, and he had only been in Damascus just a short period, many days, it said. So maybe it's 30, maybe it's a month, maybe it was two months, many days. But then in verse 25, it says, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening by lowering him in a basket. So within those 30 days, Paul had already made disciples. And I look at my life and I say, wait a minute, I'm not sure that I'm doing things right. How many disciples have I made in 40 years? Now, I know that I have made disciples. I don't know if those people that I think I made disciples would classify me as disciples, but I know that I have made disciples. But do I have a disciple with me today? Where is that person who I have either led to the Lord and discipled or someone who was a new Christian or a young Christian or has been Christian for years but really hasn't gone on with Christ? And I saw that and recognized that and grabbed him and said, come on, let's get together and do that. Where are those people in my lives? And I asked that really of me, but I also want to ask that of you. And I know that most of us here here have served the Lord faithfully, and I appreciate that. I'm thankful that we're walking with Christ and we're moving on. But I also know that there are some of us that maybe are saying, what's next? What, what do I need to do in my life that's from here on? Because as we get older, we change. Um, when you're a teenager, when you're in high school, you have all these concepts of what a, a Christian is. Well, then when you're in your 30s or 40s, that changes because reality sets in, right? And then when you're 50s or 60s, you're thinking, boy, if I don't hurry up, I don't have much time left and I'm not going to get anything done. But the process of making a disciple, I think, is that lifelong um, period of time. But when have you said to yourself, I am a disciple of Christ? We talked about the cost of discipleship the last time I preached, and we talked basically, mainly there about the time, the time struggles that we have to do all the things that we want to do, but then also the things that the Lord wants us to do. Maybe they should be the same thing, and they should be. But it, that's a struggle in and of itself. We've been talking about that for a long time in our Sunday school class, the unhurried life and the tyranny of the urgent and those types of things. Um, but the moment I'm saved, I have become a disciple of Jesus. I need help, though. I need, and I'm thankful that in this church, when Sherry and I came to know the Lord, we had that help. We had people in our lives uh, like Doug Knutson and like Mike Hustis and like Garland Likens and, you know, just all these people that loved us and poured their lives into us. And even outside the church, you know, Tom Day was a great help for us. He was a Campus Life uh, leader, the director of Campus Life in the Mansfield area and, and others. So we are either looking for someone to help us become a better Christian, a more mature disciple, or we're mature enough that we have that younger Christian that we've got our arm around and that we're leading them through not just the disciplines, but to just to be able to talk about life. And what I would like today is for you to think about these things. I don't want you to just walk out of here at the end of the service and say, boy, that was a good message, or boy, he missed the boat this time. And then you go about your everyday life, and next week when you come in, you haven't even thought about the message that was preached the week before. You haven't learned things during the week, or you haven't said, oh yeah, this applies. What, what pastor said on Sunday, this is applying to me today here. Because it should. There should be those applications every single day as we walk with the Lord. So, I guess what I'm asking is, have you made that commitment and that announcement to the Lord? Yes, Lord, I am your disciple. 
If you have said that, then there is a responsibility for you to follow through on that. Because when Jesus called his disciples, he said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And those people that followed him had a commitment to keep them. So if we say we're Jesus' disciple, then we have commitments to keep. And those commitments are learning as much as we can about him, loving him, spending time with him, uh, listening to what he says to us, and then living those statements out, Um, studying the word, and then living the word out in our daily lives. It's so important to do those things. Uh, But as I do that, I have learned that I can be pretty selfish. And I know at college, when we were in college, we would call those people kind of ivory tower people, that they would just sit in the ivory tower and they would study and they would pray and they would, you know, but you would never see them out in real life doing real things the way Jesus would do them. That's what we need to learn as a disciple. How to live here on earth, walk through the muck and the mire of the sin in life, and not have it cling to us, not have it affect us. And I think of these early disciples, Paul and Peter, uh, that they were those types of guys, Matthew, Philip. They were the type of men that did that. They, they would walk, and they didn't let the sin, sin cling to them. Now, they may have sinned. They may do things. I know um, Mark left Paul, and then they argued, and, you know, Barnabas said, no, I'll take him with me then if you guys don't want him, and, you know, those kinds of things. They, you'd have that. But the main part of our lives, we're moving forward with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I see. Paul gets saved. He meets with the disciples a few days, and then he begins preaching the gospel. And as we look even in, uh, in Acts 13, If we go to Acts 13, verse 13, we see that um, Paul and his companions uh, have gone through Pamphus and Perga and Pamphylia. John, that's where John left them. And then they go from Perga to Pisidian Antioch. And there they gather on the Sabbath at a synagogue. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the people from the synagogue, the leaders of the synagogue, asked them, hey, what's going on? Where have you guys been and what's happening in your life? And Paul stands up and preaches a sermon that says, you know, this is what happened in Egypt, the wilderness wanderings. You know, we we asked for a king. We got Saul. Samuel took care of him and, you know, chastised him. Then we had David. And, you know, from David, the word of God promises that the Messiah was come, and I'm telling you, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's basically was his message. And, you know, the people in the synagogue that day got excited, and they were so happy that they wanted him to come back next week. Well, that's a good thing, I guess, but that's also a bad thing because that gives the leaders of the synagogue, one week to figure out how they're going to kick Paul out of the area, right? So we see that down towards, uh, you know, 42 uh, in Acts 13, it says, as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. So in verse 44, when the next Sabbath comes, nearly the whole city assembled. Can you imagine that after just one message and a week of probably ministering to those people who accepted that message, the whole city, the whole village would turn out. Wouldn't it be great to see 2,000 people here from the community of New London and Greenwich? And I mean, that, that we would say, hey, the whole community came out. But that's what happened with Paul. And when the Jews saw the crowds... They were filled with jealousy and began contradicting what Paul had said and that that he was blasphemed. So Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly 
and said it was necessary for that word to be spoken to, the, um, to, to them first, and since you repudiate it and judge yourself unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. What a pivotal point in history. Um, we talked this morning in Sunday school that you know God's will uh, can be shown to us, and then we can live that out. And here's what Paul and Barnabas did. They preached. The Jews wouldn't accept the message. And so they said, now we're going to the Gentiles. And they shook the dust off their feet, and they went to the Gentiles. And you know what happened? The Gentiles, it says, received the word. It said, when the, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to earn eternal life, believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. Imagine if we left here today and we had the passion for Jesus that Paul and his disciples and these new Gentiles had, what would happen? We would hear that the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole area. What I find myself doing is coming to church, being blessed by a message, and going home and saying, I can't wait till next week to hear the next message. I don't really plan on communicating what I learned in that message to others. But if I would, the whole area, the whole region would hear the word of God. We're doing something wrong, not the church necessarily, as you think of the church, but I think as individuals, many of us are not sharing the things that we know about Jesus. In a sense, I'm selfish. I'm keeping that to myself. I'm not in the uh, forefront of my mind making disciples, or even planning on making disciples. I've relegated that to the church, but you know it's not the church's responsibility. When Jesus was ready to ascend into heaven, he told his disciples to go out and make disciples. He didn't tell the church, he didn't tell the synagogue, he didn't go to the temple and tell the people in the temple that they needed, you know, that the temple needs to make. It's not the church's responsibility to make disciples. Our mission statement says that We are here to create an environment so that the members of the church can win people to Christ, build them up in Christ, and send them out in Christ. Things like the senior luncheon that we're doing. We had 47 or 48 people there this last one. Um, And just imagine, as more of the people from the congregation go to that lunch, we're getting to know people from the community. And that gives us an opportunity to share Christ with them. If we don't, shame on us. If we do, we'll win people to Christ and then have more people to disciple. That's the process. The youth group has done an awesome job at this. They have events, they have activities, and then you know what we hear? That on a Wednesday night, When Zach didn't even plan it, six kids come to Christ. Because they took advantage of those opportunities and those activities and they built relationships. And they then, as those activities and those relationships blossomed, the kids heard the word and they came to Christ. We need to be doing that same type of thing in adult ministries, and I know that we're, and I appreciate the testimony from Tiffany, is that, you know, the work that she's put in the last couple of years uh, into the children's ministry, she now sees um, some fruit coming from that. We have more people involved, and people have made that commitment, and they're beginning to build more and more relationships with the kids in the community, and we're going to see more and more kids come to Christ. As adults, we need to take, that, take advantage of that. And it doesn't even have to be activities from, that, the, that the church puts on. 
our um, growth group meets on Wednesday mornings. And you know what? We were told that first Wednesday morning that that's the morning that the Golden Agers meet at the American Legion. So after our growth group, seven of us, the whole growth group, went to the American Legion and had lunch. You know what? That gave us an opportunity to meet more people from the community. And guess what? This Wednesday, our growth group is going back to the American Legion Hall to have lunch with the Golden Agers. Why? Not because I need another lunch, but because there's an opportunity there to get to more, know more people that don't know Christ. Or maybe we'll find some Christians there that just have been sitting in a church and not growing, not developing their full potential. And maybe we can put our arms around them and encourage them to grow in Christ and to, to um, activate the spiritual gifts that, they, that God has already given them. So you see, once we have this mentality that there are events out there that we can invade, put on your disguise as a lowly, you know, New Londoner, or uh, as a, oh, I'm just a farmer, or I'm just a real estate broker, or I'm just an insurance agent, or I'm just a whatever it is that you are, and you think you're not a preacher, and yet you can't do these things. That's why you were saved, is so that you, in your own field of expertise, can win others that are around you. And if you begin to do this, it's catching. There is an excitement in our growth group to go to the Golden Agers and get to know some of those people and see if we can't win them to Christ. There's an excitement on that first Monday of the month to see how many people from the community are coming, to see how many people from our church are coming, and to see if there's interaction. Now, last, just as, a, as an interesting testimony, last week, a member from the community, not, not a member of our church, uh, don't know that they're a believer or not, but they brought a set of cornhole uh, boards and bags, two sets actually, so that we could play cornhole. But you know what? They were talking so much, and the, the speaker was such a good speaker, and they asked a lot of questions, that we never played cornhole. But the opportunity was there. And I talked to this gentleman. I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I said, I think these people just get together and like to talk. Just imagine if we had some Christians there that could turn that talk to spiritual things and maybe invite some of those people from the community that you're sitting with every first Monday now, invite them back to your house some evening and just talk or watch a movie or play some cards or play some cornhole or something. That's the exciting part about living the Christian life. When we begin to see that going to work isn't a chore, but an opportunity to build relationships to win people to Christ or going to a luncheon or going to our kids' ball games or our grandkids' flag football games, right? Or whatever it is, wherever we go, Jesus is with us. And we can turn that into an opportunity to get to know people and then make disciples of them if we keep that in the forefront of our mind. I don't know how Paul could learn that in the short period of time that he spoke with Jesus on the Damascus road and Ananias um, walked him through the salvation experience of just placing his faith on Jesus. And, but Paul's heart opened up to this whole concept, and this is what he did the rest of his life, and it cost him his life. Uh, I don't expect us here to give up our jobs like Paul did, but within our job, within the regular rhythm of our lives, we meet enough people that we could see this whole community saved, this whole community come to Christ and grow with him. That's the concept that I believe the Apostle Paul had. If you read Paul and Peter, 
uh, what a shock for Peter when he had a dream someday that that blanket was full of all unclean clothes, uh, animals and stuff, and, and the Lord said, take and eat. And he says, no, 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 I, I can't do that. And Jesus said, why not? Nothing that I made is unclean. And then a Gentile knocks on his door, and he goes with him. And when he gets there, Cornelius and his whole family is waiting. The only person that told Cornelius to get his family together was the Lord. For an unsaved person praying, and the Lord answered his prayer and said, okay, do these things. I relegate myself to a too high of a standard in the scheme of God's kingdom, okay? I think I, I can do it. No, God could do it without me if he wanted to, but he's chosen to do it with me, using me. If he wanted to, he could speak to every single one of you and tell you exactly what you're supposed to do tomorrow. But he doesn't do that. He waits for you to ask him, right? What I'm saying just on this whole concept of discipleship is it takes a long time to become a mature disciple, but it doesn't take long to be a disciple that is totally committed, totally sold out to Jesus, and will hear and obey everything that Jesus tells him to do, or at least most everything. And you've got plenty of time to do that, at least until the guys that are coming to kill you, your disciples let you down in a basket so that you can get out and run away and be safe, right? Um, Days is all that took. Again, this is a little different. I've not really preached or just shared my heart this way before. But, But I want you to listen and think about these things. Is there anyone here too young to apply some of these things in their life? I don't think so. Even little Simon or Lydia or, you know, those kinds of people, they hear and they, and God does great things in their lives, you know? They learn so quickly when they're young. Is there anyone too old? to continue on as a disciple of Christ and share the gospel with the people they know? I don't think so. I met, uh, I I went to see um, Juanita Ambergy this past week, and she was in pain and she was hurting, but she was also saying, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, yes, come, help me. You see, even in that state, her mind was focused on Christ. Friends, we, we need to make that type of commitment in order to see this area one to Christ. And that's what I'm talking about being a disciple. Being sold out for Christ. I know that that is my desire. That's what I want. So I learned from these, and if you haven't caught on, I've been reading through the book of Acts. And then I went back through and, you know, asked the Lord, is there anything in here, since I just read through it, is there anything in here that you want me to to share uh, when I have that opportunity on Sunday? So here are the things that I've learned from reading uh, chapter 9 and chapter 13 in Acts. It doesn't take long to make a disciple, but it takes a lifetime to encourage and support them as they make their own disciples. Disciples are made through sharing the word of God in a way that will bring a person to see his need for Jesus and placing his faith or her faith in him. Then they also need to know that they're not just saved, but that you're there to put your arm around them and help them learn more about Jesus and grow in Christ. They must begin then immediately Uh, to share the Word of God. You know, when when you were first saved, at least it was with me, when I was first saved, I was so excited. I had to tell my dad that was tough. He didn't want to listen. I told my brother. He didn't understand. You know, as we went and talked to people, as new Christians, 
they, don't, they didn't understand, how can you change? My brother said, you stop drinking like that. You know, they don't understand that, but we do. And you know, as you live that life out, they understand that there's something different about you than them. You don't have to say a word. But when you do say a word, let it be the word of Christ. Help them, encourage them to come to Christ and then to grow in Christ. I learned that over and over, Paul mentions that his disciples, disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. So that should be a characteristic of those who call themselves disciples. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you know that that's different than receiving the Spirit at salvation? Do you, um, over and over we sang, there's power in the name of Jesus. That power doesn't just come from the name of Jesus, but when we evoke the name of Christ, the Holy Spirit is there in power to do that. There is power in the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, a power for service, a power for work, a power to love people. Do you realize that there's a lot of people out there today that can't love President Trump? And there's a lot of people out there today that can't love Hillary or Senator Feinstein or, you know, those kinds of people. Why? Because they, they don't know Jesus well enough to love those people. If you knew Jesus well enough, you could love them. If I know Jesus well enough, I can love Ish. Right? <laughs> That's what it is. It's the fullness of Christ in us that are loving those people. We, just, we can't crank up love. All of these things that we've talked about for years ties back to our relationship with Jesus. Friends, if we don't have that relationship, then we're probably serving in and of our own strength and power. And that's not what we need. We need a Holy Spirit-filled person who loves Jesus. And if we have that... That's enough. Paul turned Damascus upside down so much that they hated him and tried to kill him. Sounds a lot like Jesus' life. He turned Jerusalem upside down so much that they did kill him. They hung him on the cross. That's our life. It may not end up in somebody actually killing us, but it means that until the day we die, we'll love Jesus and we will share the gospel, his word. So that's what I've learned. And I know that we have a lot of questions going on. Can I do that? Have I, have I been filled with the Spirit? Am I a disciple? Am I a mature disciple? Am I not a mature disciple? How do I become more mature? We need to understand the first question is, are you willing to be a disciple of Jesus the way Paul and Peter and those disciples in those days were disciples of Jesus? Total commitment. That's what we need to ask of ourselves, and that's what I'm asking against, I guess, today, is that um, you don't have to do anything. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not, but I want you to think about these things, and you need to answer that. Am I willing... To, be a to, to give totally my life to Christ in whatever he wants me to do? That's, that's the question today. And I, I want to pray for you for that. And then I'd also like to say, as you know the answer to that, if you need someone to come along and help and encourage and strengthen, let me know and we'll find those people. If you're going to make that total commitment, I want you to know that you're not out there all by yourself. Paul came to know Christ. The first thing he did, it says, is that he went and spent time with the other disciples. And that, I think, was for encouragement and to learn some things. Because he already knew the Old Testament. He was a good Jew, right? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the Word but he had to get it applied in the right context that Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the person from the line of David who is the Son of God. And as soon as he learned that, he could prove from the Scriptures, and he did that, it says in the Pisidian of Antioch, he proved from the Scriptures that Jesus was the Son of God. 
And the only scriptures they had were the Old Testament. Can we do those things? You can if you make that commitment to him today. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for these folks for listening. You are doing wonderful things through the disciples here at New London Alliance Church. But I know that that you want to do, do more. I know that there are more people in New London and Greenwich and North Fairfield and Clarksfield and Wakeman and, uh, boy, Lord, just think if we could reach down into the, the um, Mapleton area, that school district in Savannah and Sullivan and and, and those areas and Wellington, Lord, I guess we could include Wellington, although they were my arch rivals in my high school days. But Lord, you've given me enough love that I can love those people in Wellington. The question is, Lord, am I willing to give that what it takes each and every day? Even though I have to work, even though I have duties at the church, even though I want to go to football games, even though I want to see my grandkids in their sports. Lord, can I take the time and do I have the understanding, do I have the fullness of the Holy Spirit who will lead me into this lifestyle to answer your call on my life today? I pray for these folks that they were asking these questions and that you will tell them that you love them and that you will give them the power to do all of these things if they'll just say yes. And I pray for those, Lord, that are ready to say yes, that you would encourage them and and give them opportunity uh, to be that disciple like the Apostle Paul here in New London and South Central in this area around our church. And we just give you the praise and the glory because there is power in the name of Jesus. I believe that, Lord. There is power. In the name of Jesus, if we would just be courageous enough to use that name, you will use the power. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing before we go, and that I just want to let you know that we, we do have a meeting, uh, just a quick meeting for anybody that would like to be involved in a prayer ministry. I know that the children's prayer ministry and the uh, youth have prayer ministries. We're kind of looking at adult prayer ministries. We're going to meet in the prayer room. You can go over there now. Um, Ish will be there, and uh, I'll be in there in a minute. But um, just if you're interested in, it's not going to be the traditional kind of prayer ministry. So just come over. We'll talk about it for a few minutes, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.